Uh, it's great to be in LA. Thank you for having me. We're talking about the divided states of America, race relations in America. I like to start with definitions, they help me a lot. Racism is a belief that one's race, skin color, or more generally one's group, nationality, ethnic identity is better than or superior than another. My wife and I, we have the privilege of being in Columbia, Missouri. We lead a church in a campus town. The University of Missouri is there. Some of you have probably heard of it. It's where the number one nation, the number one basketball player in the nation chose to, chose to go to college. But we also, last year, were in the news for some racial issues, tension. Tension arose between students and the university administration that led to the university president resigning. We also had a huge issue in Ferguson. If you've been watching the news, we had a number of race issues in our state. But I was at ground zero there at the University of Missouri. The president of the university was accused of being white. He is white, or was white. <laughs> Privileged. Lacking in the understanding of institutionalized racism. And therefore, he was accused of being part of the problem. I spoke to a particular MU African American graduate student during the campus drama, and I tried to understand what's going on. What is it that the millennials are going through? I consider myself almost 50. I'm black, in case you haven't noticed, and I've definitely been around the block a few times. I've been to Columbia 14 years, and my family's not had any issues at all. I was trying to understand what was going on, and here's what the student said to me. They said, the people with power are the only people who can be racist. And so in this particular instance, it was the white people who had the power. And they're considered the ones that, only ones that can be racist. I thought about this, I thought, man, is this the kind of stuff that's being taught in our universities today? Because if it is, it stands a reason why entitlement, greed, selfishness, arrogance, distrust, lack of forgiveness, and hate will continue to perpetuate itself in America. It is in my opinion that all people can be racist, prejudiced. All people can discriminate and be bigoted. For example, I believe it's possible for a black person to be racist because I was racist. I feared I feared the things that I hated. Anything that was different from me, I had, a different, I had an issue with it. I mocked the things that I didn't like because I thought I was better than those things. I believed I was entitled to the best. I was bitter and even enraged toward people that I felt wronged me, wronged my family, wronged my culture or my heritage. I thought I was better in sports and academics and entitled, I thought I was better than others I thought I was better than white people, I did. Anyone that wasn't from my nationality or from my heritage, I thought I was better than. Because I had been afforded, afforded certain opportunities in life. In my heart, I was greedy, entitled, arrogant, selfish, and bitter. Worse than that, I was a very unforgiving person. Let me explain to you how I got to this point. You see, I grew up in the southern state of Louisiana. My biological father was a Vietnam vet, and by all definitions today, he would be considered a deadbeat dad. I didn't think of him that way. He just wasn't around. I didn't know him. My mother was a first-generation college grad, grew up very poor, in a much oppressed town, little town in Louisiana. The road that connected the homes and the communities where my mother grew up what was referred to as Niggerville. This is how it was considered. When my mother graduated from high school, she was already pregnant with me, but her parents, and she insisted that she would go to college. It was important for her to get a college degree, so she went on to Southern University in Baton Rouge. And then eventually she would move on to New Orleans and launch her career, where she met and married a wonderful man named William Hawkins, who adopted me and gave me his last name. I was raised in inner city New Orleans, the third ward, a very, very, very dangerous area of the city. In my hood, 
I had heard lots of gunshots, saw him was involved in drug deals, saw dead bodies lying on the streets, new crack addicts, smoked pot, ran with a crew on the streets, got a girl pregnant by ninth grade, had classmates that were killed by ninth grade, had several childhood friends that spent time in prison. I was a pretty decent athlete, so a door was open for me, and I got my first taste of privilege on the other side of town at St. Augustine High School. I had to catch the bus, it took me an hour to get there, but my mother insisted that I get out of my neighborhood and try to do something with my life. The school was private, it was all boys, and it was all black. It was well known for its high standards in academic, sports, band, and overall achievement. It was my first real experience with being privileged. It was my first real experience with upper class and middle class African American families. In my mind, I was moving on up like George and Weezy, y'all. <laughs> Some of these young men at St. Augustine High were second and third generation grads. Their fathers were doctors, lawyers, engineers, professional athletes, teachers, college coaches, Ivy League grads, and politicians. There was even a mayor that went to my high school. No one in my high school, no one in my neighborhood attended this school, so I felt pretty special. I was very special. Our colors were purple and gold. We said the gold was for royalty. I thought I was a king. We were told to carry ourselves a little bit like kings. I love that. I share this with you simply to communicate that I grew up in a very African-American environment, in case you didn't notice that. I enjoyed the company of nearly every socioeconomic class of African Americans by the time I left high school to go to college. Today I'm sharing from the perspective of someone that was an African American male in America and now has been transformed into a disciple of Jesus who just happens to be an African American male. Are you with me? Yeah. Racism has primarily been part of the American landscape since the European colonization of North America beginning in the 17th century. Many groups have bore the brunt of racism in America through discriminatory laws, social practices, and even criminal behavior directed toward a targeted group. Let me name a few. Native Americans. With the Europeans' arrival on the North American shores and a systematic plan to subdue and conquer land came racism, bigotry against Native Americans. Europeans believed that the original inhabitants of America were heathens and savages who needed to be civilized by European cultures. The Europeans wrongly, wrongly used the Bible. And that led to genocide, mass murder, stolen land, forced assimilation through institutions like the establishment of Indian reservations. Why, did this, why was this done? Greed, manifest destiny, and entitlement. The long-term effect on Native Americans was brutal. They lost land, alcoholism, and a very high suicide rate. Another group was the Japanese Americans. You know, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii in December 1941, racism against the Japanese Americans intensified, like the Muslims in 9-11. There was fear. They were the target of harassment, discrimination, and government surveillance. Members of the communities lost homes, jobs, and businesses. There was a Democratic president with a Democratic Congress, both houses, that voted and elected and authorized 120,000 Japanese Americans to be put into camps. Why was this done? Fear, distrust, insecurity. There's a lot of racism. Of course, we know the story of the racism against African Americans. You know about the transatlantic trans slave trade. Africans were kidnapped from their homelands in various parts of Africa. African men, women, and children were stripped of their names and identities, whipped, beaten, tortured. Families were separated through the process of buying and selling slaves. For those African Americans who were free or who weren't slaves, they still faced many barriers. But why was this done? Again, more greed, bitterness, arrogance, and selfishness. You know, sometimes I hear people that say things like, you know, I want to be equal. You need to be careful what you choose to be equal to in life. Be careful. Racism does still exist in America, in more subtle ways for sure, but it does exist. And it exists in every culture. 
We made amendments to the U.S. Constitution, have Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and beyond, but the impact and tension of civil division still lingers on our streets, in our classrooms, and even in our churches today, even in our churches. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King was the one who would say, 11 o'clock a.m. Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. Sunday school is the most segregated school of the week. While Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement made contributions for civil rights in America, she still hasn't dealt with the deeply ingrained cancer in America, and that's sin. Legal remedies treat symptoms, but they don't really cure. Let me introduce you to the one, the only one that can cure racism in America. In John chapter 4, is where we'll start here today. It says, now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? You know, this story goes on and I'm not going to read it all here. But what happens here is really, 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 really interesting and important. In this story, Jesus deals with a very difficult situation, not only of issues between men and women, but he deals with an issue of race. If you're not aware, the tension between Jews and Samaritans was very intense. It goes back many, many years to when the kingdom was divided. Samaria represented schism and idolatry to the Jews. The Jews wanted to have nothing to do with the Samaritans, and the Samaritans wanted to have nothing to do with the Jews. It was a whole issue about where to worship God, whether we'll worship God on this mountain or whether we'll worship God in Jerusalem. It was a huge issue. It was deep. It was intense. I say it's more intense than anything any of us have ever experienced in our lifetime. The schism, the hurt, the racism, the pain. It's at about noon one day he arrived wearily, Jesus, in the town of Sychar. There Jesus found a woman whom he asked for some water. Since the disciples had gone off to buy something to eat, Jesus was alone with the woman. She expressed a surprise that a Jew, for she apparently can tell that Jesus was a Jew. Now, this is important. This woman saw something about Jesus. She looked at him and she goes, you're Jewish. There was either something about the way he was dressed, about the color of his skin, about how he wore his hair. There was something about Jesus that this woman recognized, you're a Jew. What are you doing in my neighborhood? Who do you think you are? And what are you doing asking me for water? I don't know another way to put this. This would be like the Aryan Brotherhood or the KKK calling up LeBron James to ask them, ask them for a donation for their social club. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, this is unfathomable. Samaritans and Jews despise each other. The, the tension was severe. It is curious that the Bible tells us that this woman was able to recognize that he was a Jew. Everyone is always looking at outside appearances, trying to figure out, what are you repping? People are trying to determine, what do you think? Where are you headed? People ask you questions. They're trying to pigeonhole you and figure out things about you, judge you, prejudge you. You with me? They can take a look at you. They can look at the tattoos on your body. They can tell something about you. Or they think they can. This was not much of a different situation here. Then our Lord says something interesting to the woman. He says, if you knew who he was, she would ask Jesus for living water. This woman notices that the Lord doesn't have anything to fill the water. Jesus, and only Jesus likes swag, right? Jesus affirms to her that, hey, my water is superior. It's excellent. If you had some of my water, you wouldn't need anything else to drink. 
I can see this old gal thinking as she looks at Jesus, okay, Mr. Big Stuff, I'll buy what you're saying here. Give me some of this endless supply of water and then I won't have to keep coming back here for something to drink. She obviously didn't realize that the living water was a metaphor for something more spiritual. You see, God's forgiveness removes guilt. It removes bitterness. It removes fear. It removes insecurity. It removes discrimination and racism. And it ushers in divine grace, amen? Now here's where the story gets an interest and pay attention. Before agreeing to give her water, Jesus told her to go get her husband. You would think it's so that Jesus could just talk to both of them and give them both of his living water. The woman who is steeped in sin, she confesses, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, that is true, you don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five husbands. The man you're living with now is not your husband. Jesus deals with the sin in her life. Are you with me? He wants to help her out. The woman realizes that he's a prophet, so she probes him a little bit more. And then she gets kind of deep. She wants to know what his thoughts are on religion, on race, and on culture. The very things that divide Jews and Gentiles. She wants to know this issue of, well, your fathers say we need to worship here, and our fathers say we need to worship there. Let's get into some heritage stuff here, shall we? Let's start talking about your mama and your daddy. In response, Jesus addresses it not only the issue of what true faith is, but he showed her the entire ancient system of religion, race, culture, this whole distraction would be superseded by he himself. Jesus revealed himself openly to this woman. And here's what he says to her, essentially. He says, the hour is coming and has now come when you will neither worship on that mountain or, or in Jerusalem. What Jesus essentially said to her was this, your history don't matter. Your race doesn't matter. Your background doesn't matter. Your hood doesn't matter. Your mama don't matter. Your daddy don't matter. Your high school doesn't matter. Your college education doesn't matter. Your color or creed or whatever you're repping, it doesn't matter. The forgiveness I extend to you is life changing. The woman, she tries to change the subject. Well, when the Messiah comes, you know what I'm saying? When the Messiah comes, he'll settle this matter. He goes, listen, I am the Messiah. She's stunned. Right about then, she's sitting there considering Jesus' profundity. And the disciples show up, and they're a little bit nervous because they see him talking to a woman in Samaria, and, but they don't want to ask him anything, so they just sort of say, Lord, get something to eat. You must be a little bit dizzy. <laughs> and this is what's powerful. Jesus taught these guys that the most important lesson you and I will ever need, sociology, biology, psychology, anthropology, all the other over 200 somologies. Jesus taught them his theology. Are you ready for this? His theology was this. My food, my life-giving source, my daily bread, my getting up in the morning, what nourishes me more than anything else, nothing else in this world matters, he says, but doing the will of God. Nothing else matters. He says the harvesting of souls. That's what matters. You read through this passage, the woman runs into town, she tells everybody, come and see a man who told me everything about my life. The people start coming from the town toward Jesus. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he looks at the people and he says, this is what matters. I love people so much. I don't care about race. I don't care about color. I care about people being with God so much I will die for it. It's all that matters. So how should disciples re respond and deal with race issues in America? 
We need to realize the problem isn't black or white, African, European, Southern, Central, Northern American, Asian, or Antarctic, or, or Australian. It's a human heart problem, brothers and sisters. All races discriminate between and among one another at some point. Hatred is not limited to white people. Long before any Anglo set foot on the shores of Africa to capture, purchase, or trade for the first slaves, slavery existed because the human heart is sinful. You need to realize that the real problem of discrimination is created and perpetuated by the greatest terrorist to ever live. That's Satan. Satan wants to keep humanity in a state of lack of forgiveness, distrust, greed, entitlement, fear, bitterness, selfishness, prejudice, racism, and anger. As long as he can do that, Satan's winning. I'll close with a personal story here. After leaving St. Augustine, I went to a two-year college at the, in Spokane, Washington. I eventually would accept the scholarship to the University of, of Nebraska. It was really interesting because I was trying to choose between schools. It was either the University of Utah or the University of Nebraska. I couldn't decide. And literally on signing day, both coaches were in my living room. I couldn't decide, so I flipped the coin. It landed on Nebraska. Little did I know that the Denver church at the time was planning to plant a mission team in Utah. They decided, no, we're not going to plant that church. It'll be too much heat. We're instead going to go to Lincoln, Nebraska. I show up in Lincoln, Nebraska. The most amazing thing happened to me. The church got planted in December. It was January. I walked into a hotel room. I walked into a hotel meeting area where they were having church. I had been invited out to church. It was a half-filled room. It was about 60 people, and all of them were white. <laughs> this was warring with my soul. I'd grown to church, grown to black churches. I love black music. I love being black. I'm pretty black. And here I am in this group. And I'm going, oh, come on, man. I tried to sit as far back as I could, far enough where no one would notice I was in the back, but not close enough where they'd ask me to move closer. You know what I'm saying? And I definitely didn't want all these white people touching me and talking to me. But what was interesting is that when church was over, this guy, this otherwise goofy white guy, Kurt Simmons, he would ask me to study the Bible with him. We studied the Bible, and like Jesus, he told me about myself. I have a picture here of my friend Kurt. He is my best friend in the world. That's us at a Cardinal game, enjoying time together. He studied the Bible with me. He taught me the truth. He changed, helped change my life. He showed me who the real king was. The real king was Jesus. I tell you, only Jesus overcomes racism in America. God bless you.